Our Katie Terhune was in court today for the sentencing and saw all of that happen, all of that unfold. Katie, I, I think any mom watching tonight would probably have done the same thing if she had to sit there in court and listen to such horrific details about her daughter's death and then to be in the same room with the man who did it. Absolutely, Kim, and it had been very quiet in there. You could hear people crying softly. Uh, what happened when she threw the bottle was the prosecutor was speaking, kind of going through a timeline of who was stabbed when. And when he got to the point that he was talking about her daughter, she sort of erupted and she came up out of her chair and she threw this metal water bottle all the way across the room. She was sitting on the complete opposite side as, as Timmy Kinner. Uh, it crashed into this wood paneling very near him and they kind of hustled him out of there. Um, and she just sort of broke down in tears and, and had to be kind of restrained by the bailiffs and some of the security in the courtroom. They almost pulled her to the ground because she was still trying to rush at him. She was trying to get to him as they pulled him out of the room. Uh, she threw another like a Kleenex tissue box towards him and then all the bailiffs and all the security were sort of on her trying to pull her to the ground, trying to pull her out of the room to kind of stop the scene. You were live tweeting uh, during the proceedings and, and the, the testimony from Ruya's mom that really hit me hard. You tweeted this that Ruya loved to read that that was mentioned in court today and that she loved to comb her mom's hair. But now Ruya's mom keeps her hair short because she just can't bear the thought of not having Ruya with her. And you know, these two were refugees from Ethiopia. So Ruya's mother talked a lot about how she wanted a better life for her daughter, a safe life, a happy life. She even went into some of her own pain as a child. She left her own family very young, had to work, didn't really get to go to school. And she said something that really struck me. She was like, my daughter was going to go to school. My daughter was going to dance. And so she just wanted something, something of her life that she didn't get in her own. And then to see it end at three is off. Tragic. It's so heartbreaking. And then, and then she mentioned that she goes to the cemetery every morning and every night because she feels like if she didn't, that she would lose touch with her daughter. She doesn't want her daughter to think that she's forgetting what happened or that time cures that pain because it doesn't. And that was clear today. I mean, she was as emotional today as if it was happening that moment. I mean, she was like screaming on the floor of the courtroom. She was crying. She was calling out her daughter's name. Oh. It was completely oh. apparent how much she misses her. Of course, of course. And and then again, so much happened today in court that you saw firsthand. You also listened to the first 911 call that came in that night made from an eight year old boy who was at that birthday party and stabbed himself. But that was really striking because it's one thing to hear somebody say, this person this age was stabbed, this person was hurt in this way. In the background of this 911 call, you can hear screaming, you can hear mm. crying. At, at one point he breaks down and he's telling the dispatcher, I'm scared, I want my mom. Oh. Where are you guys, are you coming? Oh, he's still gosh. here. And it's just, it's heartbreaking to hear the fear in his voice, knowing that this is a, a seriously injured little boy mm -hmm. with, who has just seen members of his family really badly injured, other children, severely injured and one of them even killed. So it, it really puts into perspective the terror that he was going through in that moment. That night in June of 2018, when word got out what had happened, a lot of people thought they were targeted because of the color of their skin, because of their religion. It later came out that that was not the case, that this birthday party was randomly targeted by Timmy Kenner. Uh, a lot was mentioned today about his mental health, about his criminal background, and, and that preside finally kind of gives us a little bit of insight into perhaps maybe why this happened. And the defense team talked about that. He was diagnosed as schizophrenic, who was diagnosed bipolar. Sounds like had had a, a very troubled childhood himself, just a, a really a, a bad background, was abandoned as a child. It seems like grew up in a pretty neglectful home, but also was showing some signs of pretty severe mental illness very, very young. So. I think this is a case where I, I don't think he was targeting that mm -hmm. family in particular, that group in particular. I think he's a deeply troubled, troubled. mentally ill man. Just real quick, I, I'm just curious in court, did Timmy Kenner have any reaction, Katie? Did he seem remorseful at all when he heard Ruya's mom talk or when he heard the 911 call? Did he, did he seem like he was sorry? In his statement, he said that he was sorry. He said he wished he could take it all back, that it, that's not truly who he was. But from what I saw, I mean, I didn't see a, a lot of reaction from him, even during the, the very emotional 
parts, like the 911 call, her mother speaking. A lot of the times when the victims would speak, he would look down at the table and not look at them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard to know what's in his heart, but I, I didn't see any outward signs of of him being truly sorry about it. All right, well, Katie, thank you so much. And if you wanna read more of Katie's firsthand account today from court, just go to her Twitter account, uh, very detailed. It's as if you were in court yourself. Katie, thank you so much.